Yes, sir. Um, who inspired you to become a boxer? Like, was it a Robin thing that got you there? Who inspired me? See, the thing about it is, I am always hesitant about speaking to people before I give my lecture. Because whatever we say here is going to appear out there. You know? Uh, See, that's what I'm talking about. <laughs> I'll be talking about all about that during the lecture uh, to tell you who inspired me. Because for the first 18 years of my life, I couldn't talk. I stuttered very badly. And people laughed at me because of that. And when people laugh at you, you know, and you attack them, you better know how to fight or you're going to get your butt whooped. You know, so that's what got me in the prize fight because I couldn't talk, I couldn't say, and I felt stupid. I felt like I was dumb, because everybody else could talk, so why couldn't I, you know? So I felt very, very dumb about that, and that's how I got in the prize fight, and when I was in the military, I fought. John Artis was a 19-year-old kid who had just uh, finished uh, high school, uh, was on the way to college. And I didn't know him, and he didn't know me, except I spoke at his school at one point. And because of John Artis, because he'd never been involved with the police before, I was always involved with the police. But John had never been involved with the police before. And so the police felt as though he was the weak link in this chain. And so they tried to get him to say, look, if you give us anything about this guy, then, because I'm, I'm 10 or 11 years older than John. But John stood strong. And he said, my mother and father didn't teach me to lie. They taught me to tell the truth. And that's why I'm here today. If John would have rolled over on me, if John would have took the deal, I would not be here today. I would have been executed 44 years ago. See, so John is my hero. And I'm glad that it was John Artis who was arrested with me and not somebody else. Because I don't believe anybody else would have been able to stand up like that. So John has always been my hero. And John is in Virginia now. He works with uh, Wayward Children. But, and, 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 and he's a good man. He's a real good man. Beat around the same time as you? When was he freed from Oh, he was free. He was free after 15 years. You know. Uh, and I was free six years after that. So John is a good man. I'm glad you asked about that. Oh. Thank you. Yes? Uh, yeah, uh, you obviously work a lot with. Uh, started doing what you do, do you feel that the justice system in America has improved, or how, how, do, you, how do you think the justice well, system works today <coughs> compared to how it was when you began? When yeah, you well, began? wrongful convictions is about the only thing democratic about this country. You know, it makes no difference whether you're black, white, or blue. <coughs> Everybody gets wrongly convicted. According to the American Bar Association, uh, 0.5% of all of all convictions every year is in error. That's from 12,500 to 200,000 people a year. That's wrongly convicted. And that's wrongly convicted because of overworked attorneys, because of uh, uh, attorneys that, that just don't believe in their clients. There are many reasons for people being wrongly convicted, but the most reason is success. You know, successful police officers are promoted.
successful prosecuting attorney will become judges. A successful judge goes to a higher court. So, so that's, that's what wrongful convictions are all about. It's about success. It's not about justice. It's not about truth. It's not about any of those things. It's about success. Succeeding, you know what I mean? In, in whatever you do. And so wrongful convictions take place everywhere. There's some deals with that. Well, well, there, well you're a young man. You're a young man, and you can't possibly understand. At one point, the criminal justice system or, or, or prisons uh, represented the general population of society itself. If, for example, Irish or Italian were a certain percentage of the, of the general population, then that's the percentage of Italians or Irish people you would find in prison. And since uh, Africans in America were only 13, 12 or 13% of the general population, that's all you found in the prisons was 10 or 12% you know, percent of those prisons. But in the early 1950s, when segregation began to be challenged, that's when they began to to load the prisoners up with black folks, you know, because we wanted to eat in this restaurant. We wanted to drink out of this water fountain. We wanted to ride on the front of this bus. You know what I mean? And that's when the prison system began to change. And so today, the prison system is 70, 80% black. Not because of criminality, but because that's the way it is. No, it hasn't improved. No. You got to improve it. All you young folks have to improve the system. You can't sit back and say, well, let the system do what it's, it's going to do. You got to do it. You got to take control of the system. You got to get old fogies like me out of the way. You know what I mean? I'm 74 years old. You know, and I'm from the old, old school. You got to get us out of there. And where you young people take control of the criminal justice system as well as politics, you got to take control of that and make and make the system or make the country the way you want to see the country, not the way the country has been been turned over to you, but the way you want to make the country be. That's what you got to do, and you all have to do it. Has nothing to do with black or white or green or purple. Has nothing to do with that. Has to do with human beings. That's who we are. You know, we're all brothers and sisters, whether we like it or not. That's who we are, and we have to act that way. And so, when you guys are here in school, learning how to, you know, uh, uh, learning how to deal with your minds and deal with the system itself, you got to change it. But the change that you wish to see in the world. You got to be that change. You know, you can't say, well, we want somebody to change over here. You got to be that change. Got it. You know, this is a miraculous planet Earth that we live on. It's miraculous. Anything that you want to do <coughs> in life can be done. It can be done. <coughs> My city <sitting> now, <coughs> I find that I dance better on my feet <laughs> than I do when I'm sitting in my seat. <laughs> yeah, I'm going to stand up. Uh, I found out in the 74 years that I've been on this earth, I found out that there's a method to this madness that takes place on this planet. When we learn how to practice principles, the principles of being real, the principles of being right, the principles of being good, and the principles of being true. When we learn how to practice those principles and act only upon the truth, that truth will create order from the chaos in which we live. That order will create energy. 
because it takes a great deal of energy to be disorderly. Now, the energy that we now save by not being disorderly will create motion, movement. We may stumble and we may bumble along the path of our dream. But chances are, as long as you're moving, chances are you may stumble up on something when you least expect it. But have you ever heard of anybody stumbling upon anything while they were sitting down? <laughs> no, you got to get up. You got to move. That movement will create achievement. Achievement creates joy. Joy creates love. And it's love that creates good will. And it's good will that creates freedom, justice, truth, beauty, and good. It's the, it, it, you understand what I'm saying? It's the good will that love provides that will change the world around us. It's just good will. And that's what we don't have. Good will. And we need that. And we don't have good will because we don't have the love for one another. The love for ourselves. That's what it's all about. Yeah. Yes, ma'am. She said, did I have animosity against white people? Yeah, I did. Absolutely. Because all they wanted, uh, white people called us niggers. You know what I mean? And they didn't want us to go to school. They didn't want us to eat in restaurants. They didn't want us to, you know, drink out of water fountains. You know what I mean? It was a stone segregated society. And, but that is not, that has changed the segregated society. Uh, but yeah, I, I, I had a, a great deal of, of, of problems with white folks when I was coming up. But that was what it was all about, you know? And do you, do you know where the change will come within yourself? Have no, you the change comes from you. There's no change out here. The change has to come from you. This is always going to be what it is. It's been this way forever, and it's going to be this way forever. So you don't see that there's going to be a change? The change comes from you. So it goes to you. When change. you change, you see, the only thing that we can change is on this planet Earth is ourselves. We cannot change another single thing on this Earth but ourselves. You can't change your mother. You can't change your father. You can't change your husband, your wife, or your children. But you do have the possibility of changing yourself. You can't change the government in anything but a name. But you do have the possibility of changing yourself. The miracle I discovered is that when you change, the world around you also changes. It is, in fact, the only way the world can change. So if you're looking for change, look to yourself for that change. You can't change anybody else. You can only change yourself. And the miraculous thing about it is that when you change, everything else around you also changes. That's the miraculousness of this planet. It's change. Okay. I have a question. Yes, sir. Yes, David. Uh, David. Thank you. Uh, well, I want to know if you're still writing. If you're still uh, writing books. Am I still writing? Yes. Well, the eye of the hurricane, my path from darkness to freedom, forward by Nelson Mandela, I think is my last will and testimony. <laughs> I've been involved in writing five books. The 16th round, which I wrote while I was in prison, and the eye of the hurricane. And in between is the Lazarus and the hurricane, is the hurricane, you know what I mean, there's other books. Mm -hmm. But uh, I think that after the eye of the hurricane, there's not much more to be said. 
No. You know, so that's my last word of testimony. When was it? Beg your pardon? When was when was the the last last book you wrote? It's I've been out on a book tour now for two months. Wow. And you don't have the book here? No. But we do. You do indeed. It was published in January. Yeah. So I've been out here for two months now on this book tour. So you need to see that book. You I will. need to read that book. I will. Then you see. Okay. This is a very magical book. It tells you how you can do whatever it is that you want to do. There's no holding back. None whatsoever. All you got to do is wake up. Wake up. You know, uh, there's an old Sudanese story about this fat man who went to sleep one night in the cramped quarters of his hovel. 